forever in his presence. First John, we finished chapter one last week. Uh, and yet, I'm going to give uh, chapter one just a bit more attention because of that controversial landmark passage. You know what I'm talking about, 1 John 1, 9. It's the bar of soap for Christians. For so many believers, we tend to think, well, I'm forgiven, but then I need to get forgiven through 1 John 1, 9. We had someone call into the radio broadcast this week, and they said, my pastor's teaching me there are two kinds of forgiveness. I said, two kinds of forgiveness? What are they? And they said, well, they're teaching me that there's positional forgiveness and then there's experiential forgiveness. And I said, well, that sounds very familiar. I've heard it phrased as there is a, a judicial forgiveness and then there's a relational forgiveness. And so you might have heard, whether it's uh, judicial or patriarchal or positional, oh my goodness, we're bringing out all the hot terms. There's only one problem. None of it's in the Bible. None of it's in the Bible. There are not two kinds of forgiveness. From Genesis to Revelation, there's one kind of forgiveness, the kind that God gives. And when God gives it, it's real, it's relational, it's earthy, it brings real relief here and now. There's not two kinds of forgiveness anywhere in the Bible. It's always one kind. So what are we doing today when we haul out 1 John 1, 9, apply it to Christians, and then say, well, you're forgiven positionally, but now you need to 1 John 1, 9 in order to stay forgiven relationally. And then we haul out, of course, the analogies. Well, if I had a son, I would want him. Excuse me, sir, did you die for your son? Excuse me, did you shed your blood for your son? Why are you bringing God down to your analogy instead of taking your relationships and bringing them up to God's level where he says, I'll forgive you when you don't even ask. I'll forgive you when you totally forgot about it. I'll forgive you when you can't even remember you did it. I'll forgive you when it happened eight years ago in October, mid-October, and you have no clue what the details are anymore. You have spaced out totally about it, but it's not about your memory, and it's not about your legal pad, and it's not about your many confessions. It is about Jesus and his blood. And he shed his blood once, and he died once, and it worked once, and it needs no repeat. There are not two kinds of forgiveness in the scriptures. There's one kind. And when God does something, he does it perfectly. And that's exactly what we see on the cross. It is finished. Can you imagine looking at Jesus 2,000 years ago? He says, it is finished. And you say, excuse me, sir, do you mean positionally? Do you mean judicially or relationally? What do you think he'd say at that point? Did, you, uh, did I stutter? Uh, it is finished. And so today we are continuing our series. We're looking at 1 John 1, 9. But to understand it, let's just back up a few verses. 1 John 1, 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, I love that we backed up just a little bit so we could talk about two things. Light and darkness. Because for John, light and darkness do not mean something wishy-washy. Light and darkness is not you playing musical chairs with God. Light and darkness means saved and lost. You're in the light, who is Jesus, or you're in the darkness, you're still in Adam. So when John talks about this, this walking in the darkness or walking in the light... What he's saying is, you're either in the truth or you're out of the truth. You're either in Christ or you're out of Christ. You're either in his light or you're out of his light. Now, can you commit sins still? Of course, we all sin, we all stumble in many ways, but you're going to have to stumble while you're in the light. And that's why all of a sudden you see it for what it is, you can't handle it. It doesn't make you happy. Alarms go off because you're sinning while you're in the light. Somebody turned the lights on. And what happens when you turn the lights on? You can see the detail. 
You can see what's really happening. You're not fooled anymore. And so now you're sinning just like you were before, but suddenly you got the Spirit of God in you. Christ is in you and you're in Him and you're seeing sin for what it really is, a deception and an empty pursuit. Now let's keep going because now he's going to talk about the opposite. Verse 7, this is the opposite idea of verse 6. Not rocket science, folks. Look at this. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from how much? All sin. This is describing a believer. Hello, look at the fellowship. Look at the fellowship. Is this you going in and out of fellowship with God? No, that's not what the verse says. Who is the fellowship with? Whom is the fellowship with? It's one another. So this isn't about you losing and gaining connection with God. No, sir, no ma'am. This is about you having connection with the church or not having connection with the church. It's about you being the bride of Christ or you not being the bride of Christ. It's about you being in his body or not being in his body. It is darkness and light. It is death and life. It is lost and saved. Now, this is really important. Why? Because when we get to verse 9, he's not saying, would you please get back to the musical chairs game and try to get in Christ again? He's not saying you fell out of God and you need to get back in God. In verse 9, he's not saying you lost fellowship with God, you're disconnected, and now you need to get reconnected. He's not saying any of that. He is saying, if you're in the darkness, come to the light. If you're lost, get saved. And in verse 9, when he says, he is faithful and just to cleanse us of all, notice the key word, all unrighteousness, that means when you become a believer, you are forgiven and cleansed of how much? All unrighteousness, past, present, and future, He's saying, stop denying your sins, stop living in darkness, stop existing in Adam, come to the light, recognize your need for Jesus, and when you do, oh my goodness, the cleansing that he performs in your life is past, present, and future. This is not your bar of soap as a formula to get daily cleansing. The Catholics are going to that man in the pine box, right? And they're telling that guy everything they've ever done wrong, and then that guy decides, you're forgiven, or you need to do 72 Hail Marys, and then you'll be forgiven, right? They're believing in a progressive forgiveness, little by little, day by day, mass by mass, confession by confession. And we might chuckle at that and say, that falls short of the gospel, and it does. But now let's hit home a little bit. Here we are, the Protestants. We protest. That's incorrect doctrine. We have seen the light. And then 10 minutes later, we're saying, will you forgive me? Could you forgive me? I'm 1 John 1, 9, and I'm naming everything I ever did before I go to bed. Now I lay me down to sleep. Please my soul to keep. Here are my many sins. Forgive me and cleanse me. And we wait for that feeling as if he's going to swoop down with a spiritual squeegee and just kind of clean us off for one more day, one confession at a time. The Catholic goes to a man in a pine box. The Protestant goes to God direct. But in both cases, they are believing in progressive daily cleansing instead of the once for all that Jesus actually gave us. Do you see it? It doesn't matter what your formula is. The Jews had a formula, kill an animal. The Catholics have a formula, go to the confession booth. The Protestants have a formula, ask God directly on a regular basis. All three are progressive forgiveness. And the truth is, 
you have been forgiven once for all. Hebrews 10, 14, by one sacrifice, you've been made perfect for all time. There's one kind of forgiveness in the Bible, not two. Now, we continue in verse uh, 8 here. He says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. We talked last week about somebody. Imagine they come forward and they say, I've got an announcement. I have no sin. I've never sinned and never sinned a day in my life. I'm deceiving myself, by the way. The truth is not in me. I'm calling God a liar because I'm saying I've never sinned. Is that person a Christian? Is that person a believer? There's no way you can be a believer and say, I've never sinned. I have no sin. And there's no way you can be a believer and not have the truth in you. Jesus lives in every believer. In fact, when we get to chapter 2, which we will in just a moment, you're going to be blown over. There is rock-solid evidence that verse 8 here is about an unbeliever. Because when chapter 2 describes this same person, it says the truth is not in them, it clearly identifies them as a lost person a lost person who does not have the truth inside of them. So this is written, get this, verse 9 is written to people in verse 8. That's not rocket science. That's not difficult. You don't need a PhD to understand that, that John, if he's going to write verse 9, he's probably going to address somebody who's mentioned prior in verse 8. So in verse 8, we see the sin denier, somebody who says, I've never sinned. And then in verse 9, he tries to cor correct that person, right? He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, what's the opposite? What's the opposite, the contrast for this? Well, just read the next verse. Instead of confessing your sins, you might be a person who denies your sinfulness. Watch this, verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. All right, so now we got verse 8 and verse 10. They're a 1 John 1, 9 sandwich, right? Context. Context is king. Verse 8, we got a sin, sin denier. Verse 10, we got a sin denier. And then verse 9, we got the solution for the sin denier. Not the solution for a Christian. The Christian has already received the solution. If you are in Christ today, you are a totally forgiven person. You don't need a tally. You don't need a clipboard. You don't need a confession app. You don't need a supercomputer out of Washington. You don't need a caddy counting up all your sin strokes. You don't need any of it. He's taken away all your sins once for all. Now, we're going to journey into chapter 2 just a little bit today, and we start in verse 1. Notice how he addresses us in verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, what has he told you? First, he's told you, I'm specifically addressing my little children in the faith. Suddenly, he's changing gears. Suddenly, it's not a, a, a general we, you know, if we this and if we that. Did you notice in chapter 1, the we was all over the place? We, we, we all over the place, right? I mean, if we this and if we that and if we this and if we that, even contradict, if we say we got no sin, if we admit our sin, if we say we've never sinned, if we agree with God about sin, the we was all over the place. Now he's lasering in on my little children. Suddenly it's about Christians. And he says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. There's no if, there's no back and forth tennis match about light and darkness. This is a promise. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. 
All right, he goes on, verse 2, he says, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. So in this little verse, oh my goodness, he is slamming some false teaching that is still prevalent today. First of all, you know what propitiation means? To propitiate a deity is when, you know, back in the days of pagan religions and all that we watched about them, even today, you might see pagans dancing around a campfire, and they might be asking God for a good crop, right? And then, historically, some might give a sacrifice of some kind. They're trying to propitiate the deity. They're trying to satisfy the deity. Propitiation basically means a satisfying sacrifice. So what truth are we seeing here? First, we're seeing God is satisfied. God is satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus. So I guess my question for us today is, if God is satisfied, are we? When the God of the universe is fully satisfied that your sins have been dealt with, why are you trying to deal with them? Why are you trying to get right with God when he's satisfied? Why are you trying to get forgiven when he says you have been forgiven? Why are you trying to satisfy some sort of requirement when God says all requirements have been satisfied? It's finished, and he's satisfied. And when you and the God of the universe disagree, who's right? Who's right about you and your sins being gone forever? Secondly, the second half of this verse, it does away with Calvinism pretty well. You know the Calvinistic belief that Jesus died for some people. It's called limited atonement. John is announcing it's not limited. And John is announcing it's not atonement. It's better than the Old Testament Day of Atonement. It is propitiation, God being fully satisfied, and the offer being for the entire world, not just for the Jews. This is a Jewish man, and he's saying, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Jesus died for the world. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Corinthians, Paul says, God was in Christ reconciling the world. This offer is on the table for the world. When the Calvinistic belief comes up of limited atonement, you can say, no, sir, excuse me, it's not limited and it's not atonement. It's a greater work than the day of atonement. It's not a sin covering. It's a sin takeaway. And it's not limited to the chosen few. Jesus died for the sins of the world. Right here in black and white, staring us in the face, the gospel is liberating and beautiful and simple. All right, verse 3, he says, By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Now, at first, you might be tempted to drag out Moses, right? Oh, he said the word commandments, so I'm going to bring in Mo, you know, from thousands of years prior. I'm going to dig through Leviticus and bring out my Moses to interpret my Jesus. That's the temptation. The problem with that is there's no context. There's no context for Moses anywhere near this chapter. Here we are in chapter 2. You were with me for chapter 1, right? Chapter 1 and 2, no mention of the law of Moses, no mention of the Old Testament law, no context for that. What's he talking about? Well, 1 John actually tells us these are his commands. He says his his commands are not burdensome. And then it says these are his commands. To believe in Jesus and love others even as he has loved us. Now, if John's telling you those are his commands, then suddenly we got some context to understand John talking about commands. (laughs) Instead of bringing up the Ten Commandments, instead of bringing up the 613 commandments, instead of rummaging through the Torah to try to make sense of this, We can just look at John's letter and say, oh, it's belief or faith in Jesus. That's the commandment, believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. And then it's love others 
even as he is loving you. So if you're going to do that, what's your first step? You better understand how much he loves you. If you're going to love others, even as he's loved you, you better understand how much he loves you. So seems like step one ought to be soak in the love of God, bask in the grace of God. I love a good hot tub, don't you? After I've been snowboarding in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, the greatest place to snowboard and ski ever, but keep it quiet, nobody goes but us. After a long day on the mountain, oh my goodness, soaking in that hot tub. And you know, it's kind of a good picture of what I'm talking about. Soaking in the love and grace of God, it just relaxes you. Paul says, don't be drunk with wine. Be filled with the love of Christ. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled to the measure of the fullness of God's love. Soak in God's grace. Take it in because then you're in a place of being relaxed enough to love other people. But folks, we have a serious spiritual anxiety problem today in the church. We are creating anxiety. There are many mega temples and many mega programs with many mega volunteers and much mega pressure. Get involved, do more, be more, try harder, rededicate, sign this contract, go to this class, be accountable, do this, do that. It breeds spiritual anxiety. It gets people busy, but not loving. Legalism will never produce love. We can be busy, but not loving. And so what he's talking about here is having faith or confidence or trust in Jesus and also his love for you. Verse four, the one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. All right, so this is that verse I wanted you to focus on. Do you remember chapter one? There was a group in chapter one, there was a group that did not have the truth in them. Remember that? In chapter one, there was a group and 1 John 1, 9 was for them right? Follow this logic. 1 John 1, 9 was for the group that didn't have the truth in them, right? Now, who is it that doesn't have the truth in them? The one who says, I've come to know him, but doesn't really know him. So do you see, and before you get that spiritual anxiety about trying to do 10 things or 600 things, what what John is about to tell us is, this is, this is straightforward. It's love and hate. There are people who have an innate hate for the church. In fact, Jesus said, the world will hate you because of me. So John is not trying to get you to get out your Excel spreadsheet and try to analyze your recent performance to see how much good and how much bad and am I really saved because I've done a lot of good done some bad, but the proportions are looking pretty decent. You know, this is not difficult or complex. This, as we'll see in the next few verses, is about love for one another or hate. Watch as John unfolds this passage. Whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. So he's going to talk about walking as Jesus walked. Do you think John believes you're going to have perfect performance? That's not the focus. Jesus walked in love. He didn't walk in hate. Jesus doesn't hate his own church. He walks in love. If you have a love for Jesus and a love for other believers, then you have met the requirement of this passage. You don't have an innate hate. Do you see that? So he's not getting us in a catatonic state as we're in the fetal position in the corner, sucking our thumb, going, have I done enough? I feel like I've fallen short, and oh my goodness, and woe is me, and my scorecard doesn't look good. No, it's love and hate. It's righteousness and sin. It's God and Satan. It's life and death. It's light and darkness. It's contrasts, and it's plain. Verse 6, the one who says he lives or abides in me ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Well, John, I mean, Jesus walked on water. Are you saying I need to walk on water? Jesus 
raise people from the dead. Are you saying I need... Jesus said we would do greater things. Do you know that? Jesus said we would do greater things than him. Does that mean roll the cameras, we're about to go down to the morgue, and, and everybody that's been embalmed, I mean, we're just going to zap them, and they're coming up out of those drawers. <laughs> Is that what's going to happen? Greater things. Paul reveals the meaning of all of that. You could beam a mountain across the planet. You could give your body to be burned as a martyr. But if you don't have love, it profits you nothing. Love is the greatest of all. Jesus is not saying, look at you and all the miracles you're going to do. Right? There will be many people at the end of the day hitting heaven, the gates of heaven. They'll say, God, look, look, I, I did many miracles in your name. I spoke in tongues, Lord. And Jesus is saying, yeah, I, I spoke in love. And so we get consumed with the miraculous and the cameras rolling and the focus on the show. And God is saying the greatest of these is love. And so he's talking about abiding in Christ, which is not a devotional effort that you make at a retreat. Abiding in Christ is living in Christ, and you do abide in Him. You live in Him. I know what you've heard. You were at the retreat. They had a campfire. The fire was crackling, and you put your sins on the paper. Maybe you tossed them in the fire, and then there was a devotional, and a guy said, here's how to abide in Christ. Well, you either abide in Christ or you abide in Adam. If you don't abide in Christ, you're like a branch that's burned. Abiding means living. You live in Christ. So he's saying, whoever lives in me is going to have a walk in love that characterizes their life. They're not going to do it perfectly. Do you do it perfectly? But you can't shake that love, can you? You can't shake the love for Jesus. You have an undying love for Christ. And whether you realize it or not, you got an undying love for other believers. Have you ever moved to a new location like I just did with our family a year or so ago. You move to a new location, and man, you want to make friends. But there's something special about believing friends. And sometimes you go so long with a bunch of unbelieving friends that when you finally meet a believer, you're like, you're a believer, aren't you? Have you ever had that happen? Maybe you didn't have the guts to say it, but you knew. And you found out later that they were indeed a believer. They had the fragrant aroma of Christ and you were drawn to them and they were drawn to you. See, that's not just random chance or logic. There is a spiritual fragrant aroma from life to life. If you abide in Christ and I abide in Christ, we got something. We both live in Jesus. And that's real. And that's glue. Jesus is the glue. All right, well, we're going to finish up here with just a few more verses. He says, I'm not writing you something new. This is not a new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. In other words, uh, hey, not a shocker here, folks. In the Old Testament, God is love. In the New Testament, God is love. Not a shocker here. I mean, it is a new command in the sense that it's all Jesus-focused, right? Get to know His love. There's a newness to it, but this concept is not new to you, he's saying. These are Jews. They know the Old Testament. They know God is love. And so he's saying this really shouldn't take you by surprise that if you're walking in God, if you're in Christ, then there's going to be love that marks your life. All right, he says, on the other hand, I am writing you a new commandment, which is true in him and it's true in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So it's not new, but it is new, but it's not new because love is not new, but Jesus in you is new and you've got the light and you've got the love in you. So let's just say it's not a new concept, but there's a totally new influence there's a totally new power that's actually going to make it work. It didn't work for Israel. They were told, remember what they were told? The greatest commandments in the law, they were told, love your God with all your heart 
and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And they said, does that include smelting a golden calf and worshiping it? They couldn't pull it off. They were pressured by the law into loving God as hard as they could. So they had the idea, but they didn't have the influence. They had the concept, but they didn't have the power. Now we've got God who has poured his love in our hearts. We got the concept, but we also have the influence. Verse 9 and 10, the one who says he's in the light and yet, look at it, hates his brother. Hello, this is not about some heroic effort. It's about hate. Hates his brother in, is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no, no cause for stumbling in him. He might stumble in many ways, but there's no cause for stumbling because Jesus began a good work and he'll carry him on. So you can see it's love and hate, light and darkness. It is saved and lost. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, I know, I know we're halfway through chapter 2, but don't forget chapter 1 because chapter 1 had light and darkness. Chapter 1 had truth and lies. Chapter 1 had the bridge, how you cross over. Look at who these people are. They're in the darkness, they're blind, they hate each other. These are not Christians. 1 John 1, 9 is the bridge to get saved. Not to get forgiven daily, that's an abomination. Not to get forgiven daily, that's an insult to the cross. This is about people who are in darkness and need the light. I am writing to you, little children, now notice again, he's saying, I'm talking to Christians again, because your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. We're going to end there. I want you to notice two things. Two things as we go. Get out your grammar class. What verb tense is this in? I'm writing you because your sins have been forgiven. Not could be forgiven if you remember them all. Not could be forgiven if you visit the guy in the pine box. Not could be forgiven if you do that little rigmarole before the Lord's Supper. Not could be forgiven if you 1 John 1, 9 them all. Not could be forgiven, but it is finished. I'm writing you because your sins have been forgiven. And by the way, this was to exalt the name of Jesus. Do you see that in the verse? It was for his name's sake. So that means if I'm teaching partial forgiveness, I am denigrating the name of Jesus. If I am teaching progressive forgiveness, I am insulting the name of Jesus. And if I am teaching total forgiveness, then I am honoring the name of Jesus. It is disrespectful to Christ to teach that it's not finished. It is disrespectful to Jesus to teach that there are two kinds of forgiveness, positional and relational. He's relating to you as a totally forgiven person. The sin issue is over. He loves you. He likes you. You're safe. It's too late. The gospel is awesome. You're in forever. Congratulations. You are eternally loved. Yeah. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this love. It is permanent, unshakable, unbreakable. We are in, we are safe, we are clean and close. We're united, we're bonded, we're fused. You've done it, you've done it all. You did it perfectly. How silly, in retrospect, how silly it is to say that you didn't do it. You're God. When you do it, you do it all. When you do it, you do it perfectly. When you do it, you don't bring in the double talk. You just do it. And you did. My little children, your sins have been forgiven. We love you, Father. We thank you for this declaration. We honor the name of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.